So, so was he ready? What's to happen right now? How was the posture of your heart? Where were you? Where was your mind? Where was your heart? What were you thinking about? What did you do before you walked up in this place? Where were you? That's the real question to ask. So if God was to, if you're a Christian today and you're saved today, so if God says, man, today is the day and I snatched you at that very moment and you have to give an account for your Christian life, where were you? What if it happens today, right? I, I want to read something to you all because I believe that in the last days, like the Bible says, that there will be a great uh, falling away. Individuals who um, would fall from the faith, meaning there is a, a great apostasy. Second Thess Thessalonians actually testifies of that. And yeah, I may just read part of it. Although in the Be Ready series, we're going to go ahead and we're going we're gonna to dissect that verse. But I just want to read a portion of it for you. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it, start, um, 2, it starts off like this. It says, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him, we ask not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by the word or by letter, as if, um, as if from us, as though the day of the, of the Lord or the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you. That's a big emphasis because many people in the church today are being deceived by false doctrines, false prophets, false interpretations, false churches. Have you thinking that you're in the church and, and, and you're there just for the entertainment purposes, having to think that you're having this emotional experience, thinking it's the Holy Spirit when it's far from the Holy Spirit, right? Many are deceived. And it says this, it says, um, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The falling away is something called the great apostasy, meaning individuals who thought they were had the title name Christian and then they fell from the faith. It's like I'm seeing an individual that's man, he looks faithful. He's serving in church. He's doing all these things. And then one minute or, or, or later on is like they deviated from the faith. And you're like, man, what happened to that person? Right. Um, I want to read something. Many of us here, we, we, we jump on TikTok, right? It's okay. Uh, I don't know what you're watching, but I'm, um, we jump on TikTok and I seen a, a post from a news article that actually it, it startled me. It actually gave me, man, I, if I could be honest with you, it brought me to tears because how many of us, how many of us in, this, in the nation of America in itself like, have fallen into this false, um, this false Christianity, Right? So in a TikTok, new TikTok video, there was a man. The man was actually, he had big earrings in his ears. He, he was actually considered himself to be a Satanist gang. That's what he considered himself to be. He's a Satanist. He's well known. He actually has a lot of followers on TikTok. And everybody watches him, including Christians. Right? Including Christians. His eyes, the way he put his eyes, he put these contexts that covers the, all the white part of the eye. And it has red. It's like a red thing. And in the dude, and the dude called, he says it was a man wearing a sinister looking red colored contact lenses illuminated by an era of red glow who refers to himself as a member of the Lucifer gang. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says takes moment. It takes a moment to 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 think he wanted to think progressive Christianity. So eventually, so right now, uh, according to uh, this and according to individuals that are not paying attention to this progressive Christianity that's going on in America, individuals think that because they come to church and they serve and they do all these things that they're saved and they consider themselves to be progressive Christianity, meaning they compromise the gospel in itself. And I'm going to give you a description of what he says, right? He says this. He says he takes a moment to thank progressive Christianity, saying there is a wave of Christian people, listen to this, that I have met on the app, right? And he says, I have found favor among them. They have found, he found favor among the individuals that consider themselves to be Christian. The reason why I'm bringing this to a great emphasis is because I believe that there's individuals in the church who are literally sleeping at any moment. According to scripture, in which we're going to read again, at any moment, Jesus could call us home. Like, my, my thing is not to, to emphasize the fact that he could call us home. My emphasis is, are you ready to be called home? Right? Or will you be called home? Right? And it says this, it says that, he says, there's a wave of Christian people that have met on this app and have found favor among them. And he says, progressive Christianity are, are, are what the world needs right now. 
And, and he says the TikToker whose page is filled with anti-Christian arguments as well as content promoting witchcraft, um, dark energy, satanic um, imagery, all, um, goes, um, goes on to saying regret regarding progressive Christianity. He says we both agree that religions, religion needs massive amounts of change. That's what he says. But then it goes like this. It says, what is progressive Christianity? Progressive Christianity introduces the world a belief in the historical Jesus as an intentional distance from the biblical orthodox Christ presented in the scripture. Meaning, it is a different Christ. It's not the same Christ that we say we believe in. In fact, this progressive Christianity believes that Christ exists. He was a great teacher. Right. But the miracles that he 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 fulfilled or he accomplished in the scripture was not an actual account. It was just something that we wanted to imagine. Right. And, and, and it just it brings me back to a text. And I remember when Jesus was confronting individuals, he says, he says, man, look, he says, man, many Christ are out among you right now. The fact that Jesus was in position in his time and he says, even now, many false Christ are out. So how can you imagine now? Right. Individuals falling for this false Christianity or this false Christ thinking that they're saved. I'm going to tell you something. Not everybody who says Jesus is is a follower of Jesus in the Bible. Not everybody. I don't care. You can fill in the blank, your favorite prophet, your favorite teacher. Are they speaking what Christ says in the Bible? Not everybody, not every worship song that says Christ is talking about our Christ. There is false doctrine in this music. That's why one thing I, I, I encourage, um, look up the lyrics. These people are literally preaching and they, they're singing false doctrine. And I have you worshiping a false Christ. And, 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 and the, the scent and the aroma that you're sending up to God, God is like, yo, I don't even want that. That's not me. Right? That's a whole nother message. Right? And it says this, and it says, in our day, while beliefs among the Christian life or a Christian left, very most hold the critical view of scripture as opposed to a traditional view that holds the Bible to be an inerrant word of God. Meaning they feel like the Bible has error. Like we don't need to follow everything of the Bible. Sounds like some of the compromised Christianity that I'm experiencing and I'm seeing in the world. Like if y'all knew the amount of DMs I get every Wednesday concerning things that they don't agree with, whether it's the topic of homosexuality, whether it's the topic of sin, whether it's the topic of, 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 of the way we should live our life, you, you need to ask yourself as an individual, am I compromising in these areas? Because you too could be a progressive Christian, right? Holding up some type of standard, oh, the emphasis is love. The emphasis is grace. As if, as if God doesn't look at sin the same no more because Christ came and he saved everyone. No, no, God is the same God from yesterday, today, and forevermore. Meaning he is still holy, Amen. right? So the way you treat God is the way you're going to act out in your Christian life. So these individuals, he says this, actually highlighted some of the things. He says, describing our own, because the individual who wrote this article was an individual who considered himself to be saved before. But then he, he says that, he says, because of my studies and what I'm seeing in the churches today, he says, I moved myself to an agnostic. I don't know if God exists or not. Right? So he says, describing his own disconversion, from t- traditional Christian faith, his name is Merritt, a contributing editor of Religious News Service, confessed in a tweet, like many evangel- evangelicals, provided me with some wonderful gifts for a season, but I feel like I have grown beyond, listen to this, beyond it in many ways. I have grown beyond the word of God. I have grown beyond the church. I have grown beyond the pastors, right? And he says this, he says, it's a tool and um, frameworks are no longer sufficient to sustain me in this phase of life. Like, that, like we can't look at him like, oh, 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 like he's the only one. Like you have to ask yourself, have I acted in that way? Or am I acting in that way as if God is not sufficient enough to sustain me today in my time? As if God did not die on the cross for my sins, did not die on the cross for my struggles, did not die on the cross for anything, Right? We have to ask ourselves because it takes a it, man, it takes a man of integrity or a woman of integrity to evaluate themselves. Yes. Understand this, man. If you're if you're if you're the opposite of humi- the opposite of humility is pride. So therefore you stand in the stand of pride. Whether you're one of those individuals that say, man, don't, don't mock those people, don't say these things. I, I get that. We're not mocking those people, but we are calling sin sin. 
Sin is sin. I don't, you, I don't care how you put it. We can write it down 30 times. Sin is still sin. You cannot change it, right? But these individuals, they want to change it. Watch. And he says this. He says, um, pretty much the word of God is not sufficient to sustain me in this phase of life. Why I honor my heritage. <laughs> that's what he calls it. He said, I'm mostly, I'm mostly seeking God elsewhere. There is no other way to seek God but besides the scripture. Like, I don't care how much praying you do. If you're not in the word of God, you're never going to hear from God. Ever. Don't deceive yourself. Don't fall into that state of, oh, I pray every night, but never get into the word of God. Like, don't fall into that. The word of God wants you to get into the word of God because the word of God is what transforms your life. The, moment you, the only reason why you trusted Christ as Lord and Savior is because of the word of God. Therefore, you need the word of God to the end. Right? And then it goes this. It says, um, and he says, he says, for merit, he said, elsewhere appears to be a form of progressive woke Christianity. So now it's not called progressive. Now it's called woke Christianity. Like, we know all, all, everything that's in the word ain't real. Like, they woke. Right? So that means they have, they have more knowledge than God. That's what they're trying to tell me. Right. And then it says this, the kind of affirmed in our um, pretty much in his TikTok video. And it says the reason for this video is noteworthy because it demonstrates the growing division between biblical view of Christianity and progressive view of Jesus. Two different things. Right. And then it says in that same video, the TikTok there goes on to attack traditional Christians talking about us. It says warning between your flawed Bible. That's what he says. Your flawed ideas. He says, just outright misinformation. He says, watch this. We had enough. We had enough. Can I tell you that same progressive Christianity idea or that same we had enough is in our government system right now as well. Yeah, you, 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 wait, wait, I think this is going to get better. Can I tell you, they are going to attack us like never before. We are their primary target. It's not even, it's, it's the Christ in us. Right now, it is a time for us as Christians to stand and tell the world. Our slogan is what? The people must, they must know. If you, if you sit in the period and be like, man, I heard this thousands of times, I promise you, you're probably one of these people. I promise you. I promise you, if you evaluate your life, you compromise a lot of the times. Like, when was the last time you stuck up for God and somebody say, hey, man, hey, I don't like this. You know, you receive some type of persecution. And then it says this. It says, surprisingly do the departed of uh, the, the pretty much his departure of certain biblical ideas, such as the Lord's uh, lordship of Jesus and original sin. So Jesus is not Lord of all. The, um, the original sin, that whole idea of sin, uh, we, we don't agree with that. We don't agree that everybody's sinners. We don't agree all those things. We don't agree that we need Christ to get to heaven. There's many views. We got this false, this false analogy from um, this guy, whatever famous dude name, Steve Harvey, with his false interpretations. I don't know where he's getting this information from. And, and it says this, and it says progressive Christianity apparently is able to stand unified along, watch this, Satanism. We believe in the same thing. You believe in the devil, but we, you believe, you, you, I believe in the devil, but you believe in Jesus, but we still stand for the same thing. What, what does light and darkness have to do together? The fact that these individuals really believe this tells me that these individuals are worshiping the devil and not the Jesus of the Bible. Right, and then it goes this, he says, since the cause of division, division namely viewing Jesus as savior, because that's the cause, like, Jesus is not savior. Like that's progressive Christianity for you. Jesus is not saved to them. Right? And he says, he says, um, has been removed. Biblical Christianity, on the other hand, while still offering love to someone caught up in the deception of Satanism, cannot find agreement or unity in belief. As the Apostle Paul wrote, what harmony can do there between Christ and the devil? There is no harmony. There is no let's join together as forces. Like let's sing kumbaya with the devil. No. That is our enemy. He is trying to kill, destroy you. He wants to put you in the grave, spiritually and physically, if you give him the door. Why do you think you fall into this, this state of, 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 of discontentment or depression or anything else? Why do you think you fall into these things? Because there's an enemy after your soul. 
Y'all remember the spiritual warfare series? I want to take you away from the word. God is want to bring, he want to bring you to the word. The enemy is the only one who causes division. So ask yourself, if I have strife, if I feel some type of way towards God, if I feel towards some type of way towards the church, my brothers in, 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 the, in the church, whatever it is, if I feel some type of way, the enemy is at work in your life. He's at your neck. As I read this, man, I promise you, man, I, 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 I was so mad, man. I was very mad. I was mad to the point, like, man, like, this is my flesh. Like, I wish I could have threw hands with him. Like, because I feel like you're trying my God. As if my God is not strong enough. Right? But the, the, the fact that blows me is that nobody in the churches, like, just, man, just turn on your podcasts. Like, turn on TV and turn on all these things. Nobody's speaking up. Nobody's talking about sin. Everybody want to motivate you. You're going to be a great Christian. You're going to be this. You're going to do that. Let me give you a couple of tools and things that you can go on with life as if Christ is not coming back. As if the world is not falling apart. As, 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 if, as if things are going to get better when they're not. There's a, there's a, there's a Christian uh, Canadian pastor that was just, um, he was actually just arrested a, a month ago. And, and I was watching, I was listening to a podcast interview of his wife. And the way, man, I promise you, man, the way he discipled his wife was like, is amazing to me. Like the way that lady articulate her, her words and the way she speak for God, it's beyond crazy, right? But the fact that she was calm, though her husband, she, her husband was in jail, that's what blew me the most. Because anybody else would probably fall off. Anybody else would probably fall into despair crying. She did not cry. She was standing there like, yo, my husband doing the right thing. He's standing up for God. He's, and then watch this. She said, where are you? Where are you? Where's the Christians? Why nobody's talking about this? Things of that sort. Like those things blow me because literally nobody's talking about this. You know, they're so comfortable in their chairs. They're so comfortable in their mega churches. They're so comfortable in these things. And I, trust me, I have no, 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 no resentment or anything towards mega churches because I know a couple of sound churches that are preaching right doctrine. I'm just saying like there's a lot of, there's a lot of compromise going on. And the fact that Jesus is coming back and nobody's talking about it, it, it brings very much a big concern in my life or just in my view of Christianity in general in our state. And um, the Bible in itself is written, one fourth is Bible prophecy. So if you're going to teach the whole counsel of God, you have to teach Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of maps. <laughs> Literally. Some of y'all ain't reading your Bibles. <laughs> so as we get into as we get into the Word, as we get into as we get into the Word of God, and um, we read, we 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 go over what we talked about last week. I pray that your ears are open, your hearts are open, and your mind is clear as we get into this Word. And I pray that the Word of God man penetrates your heart and it gives you a burden to go out there and speak. There's your family members dying, your friends are dying, individuals who think that they're Christian and they're deceived, they're dying. And someone has to speak. The risen king is coming back. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord Jesus, to speak to your people. I pray for the hearts that are in this place. I pray for my own, Lord Jesus. I pray for my emotions and my thoughts, Father God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that I am led by your spirit, Lord Jesus, and that you speak to your people, Father God. I pray for the hearts that came in this place, Lord God. I pray that if they have a heart of a stone, Lord Jesus, that you soften it up and allow the spirit of God to penetrate beyond the walls that they built, Father God, on Christianity, on you, Lord God, or whatever idol that they have, Lord Jesus, in their minds, in their hearts, whether it's a boy, girl, Father God, material things. Father, I ask that you tear it down in the name of Jesus. Help them, Lord God, to want to desire you more, Lord. Know you more, Lord God, because nothing else in this world matters but you, Lord Jesus. I pray that these people in this place, Father God, that they love you, Father God, the way that they say they love you, not with their lips, not the way they, because they show up to church, Lord God, that even in their quiet time, Lord God, they're just calling out and searching for you, Jesus. The time is now to wake up, church. For those that are watching us online, YouTube, podcast, IG, Father God, I pray that you meet them through the technology as well, Lord. I pray that it, the Holy Spirit just touches them on their couches, Lord, their offices, wherever they're watching from, Father God. Whatever state, whatever country, Lord, 
Let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Last week, we started talking about um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're talking on the second half, starting at verse 13. In just a few weeks, Paul was uh, ministering to the Thessalonian church. I told you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 that he only ministered to this church for about three weeks. Within this three-week span, the great emphasis was the coming of Christ. You need to be set apart. You need to be holy because Christ can catch you at a time that you do not know. Right? So he soon, he, he earnestly um, persuaded them with the coming of Christ. In fact, he used it at a mo, at a, as a motivational factor. Um, theologians would call it the parousia. That's what they would call it. It means um, the appearing of the one that we anticipate. Meaning the ascending or descending of the great one, which is Christ, right? The Thessalonians, they believed this aspect earnestly. In fact, they believed it so much that Paul often complimented them about their belief in the way that they act according to the church and how they, they, they treated their brothers and sisters, right? You know why they believed it so much? Because they took the word of God and they did something with it. They took the word of God and they did something with it. So it brings a challenge to us as individuals, am I taking the word and am I doing something with it? They were serious about the word of God. So when they heard the word of God, they understood that they were snatched by the grace of God from somewhere called hell and that God saved them in his sovereignty because there is no ambiguity in sovereignty. His sovereign power saved them and set them apart. So they understood this, they knew this, so they lived it. Right. So yet after Paul left, they wondered about their, those Christians who died. So the emphasis in this chapter is that they wondered about the individuals died. Like did God forget about them. Like if Jesus comes back now, like like what, what my brother in the grave, my sister in the grave, like what's going to happen with them? It was a great concern. But if we get to the second half of this book, which is in Second Thessalonians, we would know that false teachers came and started preaching another gospel, started preaching something else persuading them with something else meaning the individuals right were quick to have itching ears because they say jesus right so these individuals was thinking that the people in the grave were going to miss out on the rapture they were going to miss out on the coming of christ in fact they believed that they were ushered into the great tribulation and what they were experiencing was the great tribulation because of false teachers that's why we don't need to pay attention to individuals who try to put a date on the coming of christ like i don't want to hear what you got to say no man knows the day or the hour. Amen. Right? So, and it goes, Paul went on to set an example of expectancy for the church of all ages. He even expected the coming of Christ in his time. Right? It was not that he was in error in any type of way. It was no. He just lived a life of expectancy. So, it goes, proper Christian anticipation includes the imminent return of Christ. Proper Christian anticipation includes the imminent return of Christ. Not only should we expect God to show up and show out in our own lives. Everybody wants a blessing, right? Everybody wants all these things. We should be anticipating not only blessings, but the coming of Christ. Right? Everybody wants the blessing, right? But it's like, God's like, what you going to do with it? Right? Everybody wants the blessing, but nobody wants to give glory to God. You receive the blessing, you walk away like nothing happened. Right? The reason why God is not blessing individuals is because he knows what you're going to do with it. Yeah. He knows that you're going to give yourself the glory and not him. The reason why you're in this cycle, have you sat back and asked, man, God, why am I still constantly going through this same test? Maybe because you're looking at it from a different perspective. Right? When was the last time you prayed to God and you said, God, for your will to be done? Like, really mean it. Because a lot of the times we go to God and we ask God for this blessing, blessing, blessing. Okay, but if it's your will. Like, <laughs> like you want to sneak that in there, but knowing in your heart that it's corrupted, you know, you, God, it's not for your will. It's for me and my benefit. So it's, it's like this. So Paul went on to set the example of expectancy for the church ages, right? The teaching about the future of um, the coming of Christ that will be a cosmic datable event in world history is valid for us and is also was valid for the first century as well. This will be a historical event like never before. We should anticipate it because it's going to happen just like this. In fact, it can happen tonight. It can happen right after this message. It can happen right when I say the Bible says this. 
it could happen at any moment, is an imminent return. There is nothing else that we need to have fulfilled. There is no other prophecy besides the rapture of the church. And it's a great emphasis. Why? Because um, I believe as individuals, right, my personal conviction, I believe we're not going to go through a great tribulation. Reason being because the emphasis in this it was he wanted to comfort those who are alive in Christ. He did not, he did not say, yo, um, it's better for the people to be dead because they're, gonna go, they're not going to go through the great tribulation. No, no. He comforted both the dead and alive. And you'll, we'll read that in just a second. So um, the teaching about this is pretty much relevant for us today and for the first century. So just as God intervened in our world, in our world history, through the coming of his son as a baby, we should expect for God to intervene in the coming of his son in all glory. He will intervene in our history. Whether it's this year, next year, whenever it is, it's going to happen. And it's going to be a great intervention. <laughs> A, I can't wait. I'm going to be honest with you. But at the same time, it gives me a greater burden to go and speak to the people. Right? So the doctrine of the rapture is the teaching of imminency. The fact um, Paul used the pronoun we teaches that the event Paul lived, Paul lived with great high anticipation. Like God could come right now. I love the fact that he used we. I like the fact that he even put himself in that situation like God could come right now. The motivation of the fact that, yo, I'm ready, God. Like, can we honestly say that in our hearts? Like, we're ready for the coming of Christ. Right? And then he lives with this high um, anticipation even if he didn't see it. He didn't care. It's just the fact that it might happen today, so let me go ahead and motivate my people and the people to come, which is us. So as we go... uh, Turn your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to go on verse 13. Let me know where I got it. Amen. So we start in 1 Thessalonians chapter, um, chapter 4, verse 13. As always, I'm reading from the New King James because I'm bougie. Thank you. I don't even got to say it no more. Y'all already know. <laughs> Look here now. Um, chapter, thir- I mean, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, it says, but, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Last week, I gave the great emphasis that ignorance is bliss, if you will. And many of us act out in ignorance without teaching or without believing that Christ will come back. In fact, I need to point out something because he, Paul in himself, in all his uh, his epistles, he emphasized ignorance only four times. And the things that he says ignorance is on is things that are valid in the Christian community today and that a lot of us in the Christian community are ignorant to it. So one of the things that are ignorant is of the coming of Christ. The second thing he emphasized ignorance is, um, he says, don't be ignorant for God's plan for Israel, according to Romans 11. He says, don't be ignorant about spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians. Don't be ignorant about suffering and trials in the Christian life. Why? Because we will experience persecution and trials, 2 um, 2 Corinthians. He says, don't be ignorant about the rapture and the second coming of Jesus, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Ignorance is a serious thing that's happening in our community today, in the Christian churches today. Ignorant to the fact that Jesus or the God emphasized that my people perish because of the lack of knowledge. Ignorance. Why? Because no one's getting in the word. Ignorant because they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You live in despair. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I live with anticipation because I know what's going to happen. And I know in the end of the, the book, we win. Right? So I'm not ignorant to that fact. Although sometimes it's hard when trials come. And sometimes it's hard when things happen in our daily, in daily, in our daily lives. Right? But I'm still not ignorant to the fact that God is still faithful. And his promises will stand regardless of how I feel. Right. So he says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Right. So the emphasis in this is that we sorrow as individuals. Right. When an individual die, we start the way we grieve for that person. It, it, it says a lot. It says to the fact that where is my hope? Right. Two, if I have hope at all. Right. For individuals, put it like this. When a sinner die, we grieve. 
we grieve for them. But when a person that's saved dies, we grieve for us. So there's a difference. Sinners die, we grieve for them because we know that there's no coming back. For an individual who dies in Christ, we grieve for us because we're going to miss them a whole lot. Right? So even this, as individuals who sorrow in that text within its original language, it means that we sorrow for individuals, like if they're going on a long trip and we're not going to see them for a long time, in which I mentioned last week. So he says, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died last week, meant Christ died for us. Right? I love the emphasis here because he, he called individuals who are Christian, he didn't say we died. Y'all missed that. He said Jesus died, but we didn't die. We're asleep. And I'm going to tell you why he said that in a second. So he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose, again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So he's talking about us as Christians and those who fell asleep, those who are in the casket now. Right? He's telling you, he's saying that, he says, individuals who are asleep, they're not slow, they're not like soul sleeping, they're not, their spirits are not hovering around, they're not walking through buildings, walking through, they're, they're none of that's happening. In fact, the Bible says that, he says, it, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So they're with God right now. Right? But I love the emphasis, he said that we're asleep. So Jesus died a gruesome death, so we could not experience death, but we could experience, watch this, sleep. So the emphasis of individual dying a Christian dying is, is more of an ushering in, if you will. So it's more of a transition, if you will. It's more of a, a, of a, of a congratulations, you finally made it. That's how God looks at it. God don't look at it. We look at it from a place of despair, right? But God looks at it in the sense of, oh, you finished everything. I need you up here. That's how he looks at it. But the emphasis in the fact that Jesus died was meaning Jesus, Jesus died a gruesome death. Like he indeed got, died. In fact, he experienced something that we would never experience if we're a Christian today. He experienced separation from God. So the fact that he died, the emphasis was not only did he die physically, but he experienced separation, which is a, 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 a sense of hell, if you will. Because what makes hell hell is the fact that God is not there. It's not the fact that, that there's flames, although that's, that's with it. But what makes hell hell is the fact that God is absent from there. Yeah. So it goes back to good things happening to bad people, quote unquote. Right? The only reason why they're experiencing peace here is because of the grace of God abounds. Where? In the believers. So he goes this. He says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Meaning we don't have wishful thinking. Meaning, if Jesus resurrected, we should expect a resurrection as well. Because Jesus was the example of what's going to happen to those who died in Christ. They will experience a resurrection. If you die today and you're a Christian, you will experience a resurrection. Your body, you will receive your body unto yourself again. Not, not reconstructed, but brand new. Like, you ain't going to have the same scars. You're not going to have the same um, um, wrong things that you don't like about yourself when you look in the mirror. Like, you're not going to have that. Even now, even in, in the state that you don't like yourself, God loves you enough to tell you that you're beautiful to him. Yes. And he created you in the way that you are. Right? So it goes this. He says, um, who have no hope, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Meaning Jesus will bring with him those who were faithfully departed. So he's going to come with them. Right? So that, so, so that tells me that they're not in la-la land sleeping in the grave. That tells me that they're with the, with the, with the Lord, those who are, who are faithful to him. Right? So he says, well, bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This is, it changes. Because not only Paul saying that this is not my word, this is God's word. Meaning everything that I'm saying is coming with authority. So it's not Paul. It's not the false prophet at 5 a.m., it's not the false prophet on Instagram. It's not, this is the Lord speaking. Right? And then he goes this. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive. I love the we because he puts himself in the expectancy. Right? He says, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Meaning, they're going to experience the glory of God before we do. 
He says, because these individuals were concerned, like, yo, like, we're, we're going to experience the coming of Christ. Like, what about them? He's saying, yo, they're going to experience glory before you do. In fact, they're coming with God to come get you. Right? So he says, he says um, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord by, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself, I love this, meaning a personal appearance, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Graves will be open. Graves will be missing. Bodies are going to be missing. I could imagine the minds of individuals of unbelievers or people that thought they believed and they really didn't believe and they see the graves open and they see people missing. I could imagine what they feel. Right? You know what that tells me? It's going to take a lot of individuals of uh, funeral businesses. They're going, to, they're going to run out of business. Hey, there's no bodies in your grave. Right in your in your 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 cemetery, right? You know it's crazy because the emphasis of the word cemetery actually came from Christians. Christians in the second century started calling cemetery cemeteries in a sense of dormitories, meaning the body is asleep, but their store their their soul is present with God. So even the Christians in the second century they looked at it like, yo, this is just a dormitory for them. Like they just sleeping, like a college student sleeping in there, but we know where their soul is. So the word cemetery came from a Christian point of view, which interprets dormitories, right? So it goes, he says, who alive and remain, the coming of the Lord by no means precede those who are asleep for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, that's me and you, we who are alive and remain, if, if, if we don't see heaven, um, before, before the coming of God, like if, if the grace of, if, if our mission is not done, if we don't pass away, we who are alive and remain, I love this. It says, will be or shall be caught up together with who? With them. The individuals who died in Christ. Meaning we will be with the people who, who passed away. Whether it's a brother, sister, whether it's a grandma, whatever it is, who died in the faith. We will see them in the sky with our Lord. Right. And he says, he says, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is not a figurative speaking. He's speaking straightforward. This is there is no there is no um, illustration behind this. This is not no, no metaphor. None of that. He's speaking straight up like you don't have to read deep into this. Like he's telling you straight up. This is going to happen the same way Moses departed the Red Sea, the same way God will call up his children by the shout as an archangel. Right. The word caught up, I told you guys that in the Latin translation, it means rapio, which we get the word rapture from. But in the Greek, it means harpazo, which means caught up. But the emphasis is the word caught up means to be seized by force, meaning to be snatched and cannot be resisted, meaning nothing can hold you down. No sin, no doubt, no nothing because of your personal connection with God. Your unity with God, your born again process, you trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing that he died for the remission of your sin because of your intimate relationship with him. Nothing can stop this process. Nothing can snatch you back. Nothing can hold you down. Nothing can hold you down. You will be seized. You will be snatched, if you will, by the grace of God. Right. And then it says caught up together with him in the air, the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. You see, the manner, like I told you last week, the manner of this is is is, man, is glorious. Right. But the emphasis and the principle of this is that we're going to be with Jesus forever. Like meaning if you can't if you're not content with Christ now, what makes you think you're going to be content with him in heaven? Right. So, so it goes back to individuals who have this false perception of false Christianity and thinking that Christ is just like as if salvation stops at or the gospel is just good enough to save us. Right. The gospel is good enough to sustain us. We need the gospel every day. In fact, if, if we read the Old Testament, when David fell into sin, he says, God, remind me of what? My salvation. Like renew it. Why? Because he understood that the gospel was needed. Right. We need the gospel every day. The gospel is not only for your justification, but it's for your sanctification. And eventually we will receive it in our glorification. Amen. Right. So he goes, he says, um, 
Then we who are alive remain shall be caught up with, um, together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord forever. The fact that, man, we're going to be with the Lord forever tells me that we're going to be with the Lord forever. <laughs> like, we literally, gonna, that's our reward. Like, I don't know about y'all, but I anticipate the scene, the one who saves me. Like the one I pray to at nighttime. The one I cry out to. Sometimes when I feel distant, I know I just feel this whisper in my ear, son, I am with you. I love you. Like that God, that, the God that, that died on the cross for me. Like I'm going to see him face to face. And I promise you, I can't even run to his arms. We see images and we see memes like I'm going to run to the man. I'm probably going to fall on my face like John because of his holiness. But the fact that I'm going to have a conversation with him, the fact that my tears are going to be wiped away, no more pain, no more doubt. No more sorrow, no more frustration, no more depression, no none of that. Free. You know what else this tells me? It tells me that um, it gives us the gospel of continuation. Meaning not only do we have a relationship here, we have a relationship up there. Dead or alive, nothing can separate us from the unity of Christ. Like Nothing. I don't care what, not even your brother, your sister, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, nothing can separate you from the unity of Christ. That's what this tells me right there. And then I love this. He says, and thus yet shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, transition. Here it goes. Here goes the challenge for you. Comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Paul did not say take comfort. He says, give comfort because in the way God uses people or in the way God, you, pro, the process of God is you receive comfort when you comfort others. You want a blessing, bless someone. And this is not faith. This is not faith. So a seed type stuff. This is genuine heart check type stuff. And then I love this because he says, comfort one another with these words. Not, 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 not a motivational preaching of how to live. Not the 5 a.m. revelation that we turn on every, every day to hear these little false prophets on our YouTube channels. Not, 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 a, not, a, not a, a, a whatever it is that you wake up to with little devotionals. No, no. Comfort someone with these words. What words? That Jesus is coming soon. That, that it can happen at any moment. Today, tomorrow, right now. Any moment. Comfort one another with these words. I don't need your motivational preaching. I don't need none of that. Tell me that Christ is coming back for me. Because I'm going to be honest with you. You only could sustain yourself with material possessions and everything else for a short time. I need something that's going to last forever. I need, I need to have some type of hope. Some type of anticipation. Because once that, 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 that high, if you will, of me receiving this good thing or whatever that you're trying to motivate me to do. Like once, I, once that is over, I have no hope. Yeah. The only hope I have is Christ. So I need that. Don't give me nothing else. Yeah. Nothing, else matters. nothing else matters. Comfort one another with these words. So last week we started the slides. Let's get back into it. Hopefully we finish. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back into it. I pray that you got your books out, your, your notebooks, so we can go ahead and dissect what we just read even more. So Paul, what he did to encourage the church, he, he encouraged them with, um, he, encouraged, he encouraged them and comforted them with five fundamentals. With one is the revelation, which we have God's truth. Two, return, meaning Christ is coming again. Three, the resurrection, the Christians dead will rise. They will not stay dead. Fourth, the rapture, living believers will be caught up. Five, he says, reunion, Christians forever with the Lord. I anticipate that five, to be with the Lord forever. Nothing else matters. No girl, no, 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 no friendships, no, no nothing, no job, no, 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 no college diplomas, whatever you want to call it, nothing matters to me but my relationship with God. And I promise you, man, nothing should deviate you away from that. So if you find yourself deviated away from the word of God, deviated away from Christ, your first love, I urge you to go back to your first love because he is calling out to you. In fact, his grace is showing through this message to remind you that he's calling you out. So the first thing we'll talk about is the revelation. We have God's truth. 
How can a mortal, a mortal man penetrate beyond the grave and find assurance and peace for his own heart? From the Old Testament days to the present, mankind has tried to solve the riddle of death and the afterlife. In fact, philosophers have wrestled with the question of immortality. Spiritualists have tried to communicate with those who have gone beyond. In our modern world, scientists have investigated the experiences of people who claim to have died and returned to life again. They have also studied occult phenomenon, hoping to find a clue to the mystery of life after death. And guess what? They all failed. They could not find it. But I love that the scripture gives us those answers that we're seeking. Like you don't look, need to look nowhere else. You don't need to go see someone who read palms. You don't need to see any of that. You don't need to throw chakras or beads, whatever. You don't need to do any of that. Right? He's telling you all your answers are found in the scriptures alone. There's only one God that you can speak to, and that's, that's the God of the Bible. There's, there's many false gods. In fact, Joey's been preaching about idols. Like you have to ask yourself in the swing, which God you talking about, which God you worshiping? Many Christ, but there's only one Jesus Christ of the Bible, one Messiah. Nothing else matters. And if it, if it, if it deviates from the teachings of the scripture, it is not our Jesus Many false religions, as far as um, even Mormons, man, they sound, they sound so convincing, but it is not Jesus of the word of God. Anything that's saying that Jesus and, and the devil are brothers, that is not my Jesus. That's another false interpretation of your Jesus you made up. And I'm telling you that from a personal point of view, because I, I came from that as a kid. I know what Mormonism is. Like, I know what that is. And that false teaching of it. There's only one Jesus, and it's in the scripture right here. The word of God, John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we as Christians need not to wonder about death, for we have a revelation from God in his word. Why substitute human speculation for divine revelation? Right? It's important to know that the revelation concerning death in the afterlife was not given all at once. So if anybody says that they have all the answers, guess what? They're a liar. So it says we must keep in mind that God's revelation was gradual and progressive and that it, it climaxed in the coming of Christ who abolished sin and brought life and, immort and immortality to light through the gospel. Meaning we don't need any other message. I told you last week if we had nothing else in the scripture but the gospel that will be enough. All we need is that life changing message and we hold on to that to dear life. I just think about the individuals who are in China being persecuted. They literally, they're just ripping pages out of the gospel. I need this. This is what I need. And they stuff it in their, their pockets and their shirts. And, and if you want some eating it, knowing that they're going to digest it and it's going to come out and they're going to be able to use it. Like, picture that. Y'all got this? So we look to Christ in the New Testament for the complete revelation concerning death. Since our Savior has conquered death, we need not to fear death or the future. Why? Because the authority of God's word gives us the insurance and comfort we need. You need comfort? You want, you want to be encouraged? Open the, book, open the Bible. All the encouragement you need is right here. Y'all got this? The next one we talk about is the return. Christ is coming again. Paul expressed a great emphasis on the return of Christ in the Thessalonian letters. Paul related Christians, um, Christ's return to salvation, service, and stability. Meaning you could be sustained by this message in itself. Why? Because we anticipate the great hope in which it is. Right? So in chapter 4, he related to sorrow and he showed how the doctrine of Christ's return can comfort the brokenhearted. Individuals who are in despair, whether you're a Christian and in a dry season... You can be comforted that you will not be in that dry season forever. Why? Because Christ will come back and he will comfort you. In fact, you can experience freedom from drought by simply submitting yourself in humility, getting into the word of God. Like rub off on some other Christians. Like spend some time with a brother and sister. Like pray with someone. Come on Sunday service. Join the team. Work and do something for the, for the church. So it says, Paul did not say that the soul went to sleep at death. 
he made it clear that the soul of the believer went to be with the Lord. Them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That is the great emphasis. Like that was the comfort words. Those who, are, who sleep, they will come with him. He cannot bring them when he returns unless they are what? With him. He can't bring nobody unless they're with him. So that's what Paul was saying. Like they're with him. You could take confidence in the fact that those who, are, who died in Christ, like we don't need to sorrow, we don't need to cry over them because they're doing better than we are. In fact, they probably already received their reward. It is not the soul that sleeps, it is the body without the spirit is dead. At death, the spirit leaves the body and the body goes to sleep and no longer functions. The soul spirit goes to be with the Lord. If the person has trusted Jesus, absent from the body and present with the I want to give a great emphasis. So the Bible says that Jesus will come with a shout as an archangel, right? In a sense, that word archangel doesn't mean that he's an archangel. It's possible that they could be referencing Jude 1 when Michael was the emphasis of an archangel. Maybe Michael might shout, but I believe that the interpretation means that uh, emphasis of Jesus' authority. Exactly. Something went wrong. So, so of great authority. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, great authority. So, so do we remember when Jesus expressed his authority in John chapter 11? He emphasized to the woman that was, that was mourning, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe, you will never die. And then he challenged her. He says, do you believe this? And then she emphasized, she said, Jesus, I believe that, that he would be raised again, like in the resurrection. Right? Jesus, she not knowing that Jesus' authority and his intentions was to call her brother right out the grave right now. But I want to emphasize something. So he says he stood by the grave and he, he made a shout. What was the shout? Lazarus what? So in the same sense, saints come forth. Why? Because my people hear my voice or my sheep hear my voice and they know me. So the emphasis made in this text is the fact that the same way God, Jesus called the Lazarus from the grave, he will call those bodies from the grave and he will call us because we know his voice. And the emphasis is his authority over death. The fact that we will experience we, those who are in Christ when they come in Christ, we won't experience death. Meaning it shows that he had dominion, if you will, over death. Like we would not experience it. Like I, I, I'm going to be honest. I, that's what I hope for. I'm pretty sure everybody, we don't want to die. It's not that I fear death. I just want to experience going up. Like I just want to see it go. I just want to go up. If I don't, it's okay. But at the same time, I, I do want to see that. Like I might put my fist like super, whatever. Um <laughs> So based on the authority of the word of God, Jesus will one day uh, return and bring his people with him. Y'all got this? So when will this event occur? Nobody knows. Um, the doctrine of the Lord's return is known as theologians of the doctrine of imminent return of Jesus. Imminent means it could happen at any moment. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen right now. As Christians, we do not look for signs. I'm going to say that again. As Christians, we do not look for signs. Nor must any special events transpire before the Lord return. These great events will take place in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Like there is no other sign that we need. Right? It says Jesus will return in the air and this is where we shall meet him. Suddenly millions of people will vanish. Like I honestly want to just see the face of the people who didn't believe. Like I, just, like, I want to know if I go to heaven like it's going to be on a projecting screen like the, their face, like, oh, shoot, it really happened. Like the people that mocked. And, 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 and in fact, Peter actually, in his epistle, he actually emphasized, he said, man, don't worry about these people who's mocking. He said, they're going to be saying, man, where's this promising of the king that you return? Even Christians. They're going to be like, where's the promising of this Messiah? He says, then look up, redemption draws. At that moment, that's when you would see the son of man coming in cloud with great power and glory. Like, just to, just to, man, just, just to think that. Because I don't believe that the rapture of the church is going to be a silent thing. The fact that a trumpet will blast, I believe that people are going to hear something, not knowing what it is, but something's going to, they're going to know something happened. 
and something took place. Like anybody, anybody in here ever had that like rapture moment? I don't know, man, I remember I was in the shower, I heard something. Not like this, Lord, let me put on my clothes first. Like, I, I, like for real, you ever turn off the shower? That was, that was me, I don't know, whatever. Okay, oh, thank you, for real? And I went up the escalators, you remember, I remember that day. But yeah, man, I just had, I, I had many rapture moments. I remember, I remember when, um, I think it was Marcia, she called me. <laughs> she had a rapture moment because she was calling everybody in the ministry. Nobody answering the phone. <laughs> she called me, I answered. She said, oh, thank God, you still here. What? <laughs> what? I don't want to be here. Like, what you? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, don't, uh... <laughs> And I think, I think it, was, it was during the time I was preaching in time. So everybody thought Jesus was coming at that moment. But that was fun. It was crazy. Will called me right after that too. <laughs> Will called me. He said, Messiah says, Messiah says she's still here. Like, he said, I called Chi Chi, but you still here. So I know we still here. <laughs> So the guy took the cars and like. No, I took everything. This is me on the road. Like I looked to my right, I looked to my left, nothing. And I was like, this is scary. Oh, the entire earth but me. I was like, why not? Hey, thank God it didn't happen. We're still here, right? Right. But when it do happen, imagine how people will feel. You know, um, whether we're Christians, uh, live or die, we have nothing to fear because Jesus will come either with us or for us. The fact of his return is a comfort to our hearts. Like, I anticipate it, man. I think about it every day. The moment I wake up, I think about, like, how, how about if it happens today? Like, I think about it all the time. I'm taking a shower. I'm brushing my teeth. I'm like, yo, it might happen today. Like, where's my heart? Where's my mind? God, please fix my heart on your mission, what you want me to do. I pray that there's nothing replacing anything in, in my mind or in my heart, anything that would um, just blind me from what you're doing on the earth right now. Because I do believe that God is preparing the world, the world for his coming. Like, I do believe that. Like, if we see everything, is it like God is softening it up for us? Like, God is softening the heart of people. Like, right, I promise you, man, if you ask people, like, people right now are searching for hope. And we have the answer. But us as Christians, but nobody's speaking. The third thing is the resurrection. The Christian dead will rise. When Christ returns in the air, he will issue the, short, um, the shout of command, and the dead in Christ shall rise. This does not mean that he will put the elements of the body together again, for the resurrection is not reconstruction. He will make all things new. When Jesus Christ returns in the air, he will call to himself only those who are saved through faith. So it gives us a time right now to have spiritual inventory do we really love Jesus the way we say we love Jesus? Why? Because this is called the first resurrection or the resurrection of life. At that end time, just before God ushers in the new heaven and earth, there will be another resurrection. This is called the second resurrection, which is the resurrection of judgment. We cannot say Matthew 24 talks about um, 1 Thessalonians because Matthew 24 talks about the angels gathering the people. And he's specifically talking about the Jewish people. But Fester Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about the church. Why? Because we are in a place called the age of grace. We're in the church age. The focus right now is for us to be sanctified to prepare us for Christ. So when Paul emphasized we need to be set apart, we need to live holy lives, we need to remain or remove ourselves from sexual morality, remove ourselves from things that would pervert us from God seeing us as his son, right? He's telling us be set apart because Christ could come right now, right? I'm calling you to be set apart. I'm calling you to be holy because holy like I am holy. So the fact that Matthew 24 talks about the coming of Christ when Christ will come and makes his dominion, make his, his thousand year reign on earth is not the same account as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I will emphasize that more through the, the Be Ready series in itself. 
So this is called the first resurrection or the resurrection of life. Y'all got this? Um, the fact that Jesus rose from the, be- the dead proves that there is a resurrection. The Christian doctrine of resurrection assures us that death is not the end. The grave is not the end. The body goes to sleep, but the soul goes to be with the Lord. When the Lord returns, he will bring the soul with him. He will raise the body in glory, and he will unite the body and soul into one being to share his glory forever. It doesn't matter if your body was cremated. It doesn't matter if their body was tossed somewhere else because the Bible says because of sin, we will experience death. He says from dust you shall return, meaning the same way God recreated or he created man out of dust will make you think that he cannot take ashes and create another body again. We, we, we serve a powerful God. Like there, there is no, uh, you cannot put nothing on him. Like there's nothing that um, can't even think of the word right now. There's no limit for our God. The fourth thing is the rapture. Living believers caught up. The word rapture is not used in this section, but it is the literal meaning of caught up. The Latin word rap, raptio, or rapio, right, means to seize, to carry off, and from it we get the English word rapture. Like I was telling you earlier, there are various meanings of the Greek word that is translated caught up. Each of these meaning add a special truth to the doctrine of our Lord's return. So what I did was I took the word caught up and I broke it down in four specific ways in the Greek and what it means in the interpretation. And, and I promise you it would, it, it would bless you. The reason why it would bless you because it would give you a more reverence to the act of the rapture of the church and a better anticipation of it. So it says the first one is to catch away speedily, meaning it will happen fast. Like you blink your eye, you're there. Right, so, so when the Lord returns in the air, we who are alive will be caught up away quickly in the twinkling of an eye. This means we should live each moment in the expectation of our Lord's return, right? Unless he comes and find us outside of his will. As Christians, man, it, the Bible clearly says that we are called to do the will of God, not our own will. Doing his will leads us to doing our purpose because we were called with a purpose. We cannot take something or an idea said, God called me to start this organization, to lead this, to do this, and then say, I'm going to put this stamp on it because that's what God wants me to do. And God never called you to do that. You're living outside of his will because a lot of the times the will of God is contrary to what you want. It's outside of your comfort zone. It's something that you could not see yourself doing in a thousand years at all. But yet God will sustain you and he will give you the grace to desire it even more. So to catch away speedily. The second thing in the Greek, it says to seize by force. Does this suggest that Satan and his armies would try to keep us from leaving the earth? So it brings a question. Why is he seizing us by force? Like, would the enemy try to entrap us with our habitual sin? Would he try to keep us from doing the will of God? Will he keep us trying to, to, trying to deviate us from going to church, deviate us from getting into the word of God, to going dry in our prayer life? Like, it, it brings the question, like, what is he going to try to do to try to stop it? Can I tell you that he's already working? He's already preparing the world for the rapture of the church. For those that came to Billy Crone, I believe that one of the things they emphasize as far as the UFO sightings, I believe that that's a great deception that the enemy is going to use for the individuals when we're caught up. Like to deceive the people because the new age belief, those who worship the chakras and doing all these beads and all these things, I'm sorry, you cannot be a Christian and do those things. You cannot. That is contrary. That's called idol worship. You believe in those things more than you believe in the power of scripture. Contrary. I don't care if you, if you go to the voodoo priest and you put on them beads and you think that you're serving our God. You're not serving our God. That's contrary. That is not in scripture. I don't care how much you go to the altar at, at a Catholic church and you put on the little cross necklace. That is not going to save you. The rosary. Thank you for giving me that. Um, it's not going to save you. Doesn't matter. So this, does this suggest that Satan and his armies would try to keep us from leaving earth? Or maybe some of the saints would be so attached to the world that they must be literally dragged away. So are you too caught up in the things of this world that you forget 
or you deviated from the work of God. You're called to make disciples of all nations. Meaning if you're not spreading the gospel, you're outside of the will of God. If you're not sitting there speaking to your individuals, knowing that your friends are dying, knowing that they're going to hell, and you're just living a a life of, I got salvation, who cares about them? Because that's what you're saying, even if you're not saying it out your mouth. You're not speaking, you're saying that. Right? Meaning you're too attached or you're consumed with self. So that means self-love. That means you made an idol of yourself. Because you consume and you care, you care about yourself more than you care about the things of God. So therefore, are the saints so attached to the world that they must literally be dragged away? The third thing in the Greek, it means to claim for one's own self. Meaning Jesus is going to call us to hold us, to claim us. Like these are my people. Like he's going he's gonna to tell, not only is he saying that the spirit of God is in you and the moment you trust that Christ is Lord and Savior, he's telling the enemy, watch this, I'm calling them and I'm claiming them for myself. Yeah. Right? So the views of the rapture from the Lord's point of view is as he comes to claim his bride, like they're mine. Like you can no longer harm them no more. You can no longer deceive them no more. You can no longer insert doubt. You can no longer insert depression. You can no longer do anything to them. I am claiming them unto myself. Do you believe that, saints? Like, like if, you, if, if you grasp that, right, to the fact that Jesus is saying that I'm coming back to keep you to myself. Like, to me, man, that, that means the world to me. For individuals who felt, like, neglected, like, people don't want me no more. Like, feeling, like, abandoned. Feeling alone. Right? Isolated. Like, I'm not good enough. Jesus says, not only did I die for you, but I'm going to call and claim you for myself. Like, that should put some type of fire in you to understand that it should show his love for us. Like, uh, you no longer would be tormented no more. Like, you don't, you don't need to go through that no more, brother. You don't need to go through that, sister. You don't need to go through that no more. Like, like I'm going to claim you to myself. Like, that means the world, that's what I anticipate the most. The fourth thing is to move to a new place. You know how it is to move. Nobody likes to take boxes. Guess what? You don't have to take nothing with you. All you need is you. Paul used this word when he described his his visit to heaven in 2 Corinthians. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And when he comes, he will take us to that glorious place that he went to go prepare for us. We are pilgrims. Listen to this. And strangers in this world. This is not our home. We are just passing by. You should not be attached to the things of this world. That doesn't mean they stop working because Paul was telling them, what y'all stop working for? You got to be a witness. Keep working. Keep doing all these things, but don't get too attached to it. So he says, our true citizenship is in heaven. Like I tell you in my front desk, I write, man, I, I got real big. I said, man, this is not my home. This is not my reward. Like, I, I don't care how much rewards I get. How much a uh, good job you're doing, man. You're doing great. You can preach. You, I, mean, I don't care about none of that. I'm just a man being sanctified like everybody in this room. Amen. And this is not my reward. Five is to, re- to be rescued from danger. This suggests that the church will be taken home before the time of the tribulation that will come to this world from God. Seem to state this clearly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Because the emphasis is that these individuals, as we would get into the the next side of this epistle, if you will, the emphasis is that these individuals were deceived by false teachers thinking that they were going through the tribulation when Paul would emphasize, yo, you're not even experiencing the tribulation yet. Christ ain't come get you yet. And guess what? You're going to be free from that. And in the Greek, that word caught up means to be rescued from danger. That in itself should tell you that we would not experience the great tribulation, and that's my personal view on it. Although there's many interpretations, people would think the pre-tribulation, just to give you a couple, the uh, mid-tribs, pre-wrath, or post-tribulation, all those things should not separate us to the fact that God died, he saved us unto himself. Whether Whatever um, interpretation you get from it, my personal conviction is that we're not going to experience the great tribulation. The Great Tribulation is um, one of the worst time. The Bible says that uh, it's going to be the worst time. This is going to be the worst, pretty much. God's wrath will be poured upon the earth. 
like never before. We think things are bad now, so imagine um, that um, intensified. So everything from, uh, imagine the spirit of God would be removed according to the scripture. So peace would be removed in a sense. So there would be no peace on earth. The Bible actually says that people would search for death and they would not find it because of what they see falling upon the earth. Imagine great earthquakes. Imagine great despair. Imagine all these things happening all at one time. In fact, the Bible says that if he did not stop it, he says not even one life will be spared. That's how bad it would be. So will the unsaved world be aware of what's happening? Will they hear the shout, the voice, the trumpet? It, um, First Corinthians indicates this will happen suddenly, that it will be over in the twinkling of an eye. Millions of people will vanish instantly. No doubt there will be a chaos and great concern, except for those who know the Bible's teaching. The world will wonder at what happened. So if you're an unbeliever today and you're sitting in here and you're like, man, I hear this. When it happened, you'll be one of those people that heard the word of God for yourself. And you'll be like, oh, shoot, it really did happen. I pray that nobody in this place will stay behind. I pray that you take heed to this and you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Whether you understand it or not, I know that the word will go forth and it will touch you in some type of way to understand like, yo, I need to be, I need to be saved. Whether, whether the rapture happened or where death meets you first. You will see him one day. And the last emphasis would be reunion, Christians forever with the Lord. You and I shall meet the Lord in the air in person when he comes for us. The the Greek word translated meet carries the idea of meeting a royal person or an important person. So in the Greek, the word meet is not just meet. It's to meet someone of high importance. We have walked with Christ by faith here on earth, but in the air we shall see him as he is and become like him. Like to become like the one that we see. Like we have right now we have like a, I look at it like we have like this little, we have a veil over our eyes, if you will. Like we know Christ because of how much we dig into the scripture, right? Or our intimacy with Christ. But to the fact that we're going to see him as he is, meaning in all his glory and all his power, that's going to be a different experience. It's going to be beyond what I ever think or whatever I thought. It will be a glorious meeting because we shall have glorified bodies. Glorified bodies. Amen. Let me know when I got this. Y'all got it? When he, uh, when he was here on earth, Jesus prayed that we might one day see his glory and share it. And we will see his glory and we will share it. The suffering that we endure today will, transfor- will be transformed into glory when he returns. Everything that you're going through, everything that you're experiencing today has purpose. Whether it's to save another individual or whether it's to reap the reward when he sees you face to face. So it goes back to grieve with purpose. Suffer with purpose. Endure with purpose. It will be an everlasting meeting for we shall forever be with the Lord. The goal of redemption is not to just reduce us from judgment, but to relate us to him. Like we're going to be like him, not in his, in his majesty or, of his, or him in, in, in the sense of glory. Like we will be immoral, I'm immortal. Like we won't die no more. Our meeting with the Lord would also be a time of reckoning. This is called the judgment seat of Christ. We will not only meet our Lord Jesus at the rapture, but we will also be reunited with our believers, our believer friends and loved ones who have died. So not only we're going to see Jesus, we're going to see the people who we knew died in Christ. I believe we're going to be shocked. I believe we're going to see individuals we didn't think that made it, but they made it. And the individuals that we thought made it, they really ain't made it. Like, how, how, how crazy is this? Like, man, I emphasize the fact that you need to get your life right with God so much that, like, you can't fake, like, you could fake it for so long. Like, 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 who are you trying to convince? Like, 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 it's like this, it's like, like, are you going to be in hell? Like, ah, they think I'm in heaven. Like, like, how perverted is that? Like, how deceptive, how deceptive, you know, deceived you are to think that, like, how deceive, how you try to deceive the individuals to make you think like you're this good Christian, but in all actuality, you're on your way to hell. 
And then people would say, like, man, he was a great man of God, not knowing that you literally deceived him all the way to hell. Like, you're, gonna be, you're not going to be in hell pointing up like, ah, they think I'm in heaven. No. You're going to regret everything. So right now is the time to get right. Like, if you, even your false interpretation of who God is, like, right now is the time to get right. It is only the grace of God that you even sitting in these chairs today, man. Great is, um, death is the great separator, but Jesus is the great rec- reconciler. It would be good for us to examine our own hearts to see if we are ready to meet the Lord. So are you ready to meet the Lord? Like, are you prepared for his coming if it happens now? Tomorrow? Whatever it is, if it happens, are you prepared? Where is your heart? Where is your mind? What are you thinking about? One mark of a true Christian is, is his eager looking for the coming of Christ. You want to know if you saved or not? You want to know if you're walking in the will of God? Are you anticipating the coming of Christ? That is a one mark of, of, of that is a one mark of an authentic Christian, an individual who anticipates his king. As we grow in the Lord, we, we not only look for his appearing, but we look for we love his appearing. So now we desire and we anticipate and we can't wait because we have this hope in and we keep our lives pure so that we may not be ashamed that it's coming. Yeah, Joey. What you mean I'm not feeling you? That then I would say for an individual of that such, because um, I'm pretty sure you, it, there's many who feel that way. Mm-hmm. I would say to reconcile or uh, recommit your relationship back to him. Change your perspective, whether you're going through a trial, whether you're going through a season, or whether you're in a cycle of, of, of habitual sin or whatever it is, um, there is still time. His grace is still sufficient for your trials. Like, his promises are still sufficient. Like, when it comes down to like this, when I feel alone, I remember the promise that I would never leave nor forsake you. That is a promise. Like, despite how I feel, I still focus my perspective on the promise. Like, I know that he is with me. Half of the time, sometimes I, I sit in prayer, like, I know he's sitting with me. Sometimes I imagine, right, his comfort around me, and sometimes I feel his presence so heavy that I know he is with me. There is great comfort in his promises. So I will redirect an individual who is in a place of drought. I will redirect them right back to the scripture to focus on the promises of God. I don't know the promises of God. Okay, well, you need to be intentional about, about getting close to someone that can help you through this time and this season. Because we're not meant to do with the Christian life alone. The one who isolates is the enemy. The enemy wants to keep you distracted. The enemy wants to cause division. So if you are individual thinking that you don't need to be discipled, you, you just, I could do this on my own, or I get into the word, I, I'm confident in myself, but yet you don't, you, don't, you don't rub off. You're still being disobedient because the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. And it does not mean only in church. It means outside of church. In fact, you're a real Christian. Watch this. You be, it shows you're a real Christian when you do Christianity outside the four walls of the church. It shows you're, Chris, you're a real Christian. Because anybody could come to church. Anybody can clothe themselves up to look like a Christian. But real Christianity starts when you hit those doors. So I would redirect an individual back to the promises of God to focus on Christ alone and nothing else. In fact, man, I challenge everybody, man, to... Man, the throne, whatever it is, whatever idol that's in your heart, if it's not Christ alone, Christ is everything. We don't need nothing else. 
I promise you we won't need that. We don't need no motivational preacher. We don't need nothing. Christ alone is sufficient to sustain you today. So it says death is a fact of life. The only way we can escape death is to be alive when the Lord Jesus returns. So the question I ask is, am I prepared for his coming? Am I prepared to die? I'm going to tell you now, I'm a living martyr for God. Whether I live or die, I know where I'm going. I, man, I told myself many times, I said, man, I'd rather die preaching the word of God. I'd rather die evangelizing. I want him to catch me doing his work. Like when Jesus come back, when it says it's right there, I want to be able to be praying for someone, giving them salvation, and we go up at the same time. Like imagine that, like we're in a prayer circle and all of a sudden we all gone. Or you're knocking on the door, man, hey brother, can I pray for you? We just come here to pray and, get, and share you some good news. Like imagine he comes at that moment. Like I want him to catch me with my hands dirty to reap that reward. Oh, wait, oh, you're talking about like in, I mean, I, mean, I think, I think that's, um, you're talking about like doing things for God. Yeah. Okay. No, I, 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 I agree. I don't think we'll ever be done, to be honest with you. Okay. In the sense of I'm not done in what? But to, all right, so, so to answer that question, no, no, I get, I get what you mean now. So to answer that question, um, and I don't mean this in a bad way, okay? Um, who are we to say that we're not done yet? You know what I'm saying? So if the grace of God, so if the grace of God was to snatch you off of this earth, we're not going to be in the presence of God saying, but God, I wasn't done yet. Yeah, it was. Your, your reign was over. You did exactly what I needed you to do. So it goes back, it goes back to, it goes back to our perspective in the way we look at God. Because pride, right, could be a major factor in, in, in that situation. The only reason why I say that is because it's like we place ourselves or we place our ideas or we place our ambition above the word of God to a sense. So for me to say that um, is me trying to have control of his coming. Instead of allowing him to have control of everything. Your job as a Christian is just to be prepared at all times. Keep doing. Right? So the saying is, um, you live as if he's coming today, but you plan as if he's coming 10 years from now. Or you live as he's coming 10 years. I mean, yeah, you plan as if he's coming 10 years from now. So even in your own personal life, and me, myself included, I plan like, man, I'm going to live for a long time. But who am, I to, you know, who am I to say? What I do, though, I plan with leaving room. Spirit of God, you move. Like, because then it goes back to the book of James, man. He says, a foolish man plans his ways. Like, you don't even know that your soul is required of you tonight. You over here planning to do all these things. And God says, I'm calling you home tonight. You know, so, so the, when you plan and when we, when we have these, these desires and everything like that, I go back to the throne of God and I ask him, um, are my desire your desires? You know, so God will finish because the Bible says that he will, he's the faithful. So God will finish the good work he started within you. And that is a promise. So if we want to reiterate promises, God says, I will finish the good work that I started within you. That work is called sanctification. So to answer that question, man, God's going to finish. So if he says it's time, it's time. We're going to be in his presence. Man, I'll be honest with you. Whether I get one ruby, two rubies, a crown, I don't, man, I want to be in his presence. What's up, Kimo? Um, and we almost done. What about for someone who is not saved and they and they're like, man, I know the coming of Christ is coming, and I, I'm hearing that Jesus is coming, but I don't know if I'm ready for it. Like, I know that Jesus is coming, but I don't know if I'm ready for it. Um, when I trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, I didn't know much. I just knew, and I heard the word come. 
Come as you are. Don't go to your neighbor. Don't go to your friend. Don't go to a false religion. Don't go to church. Don't go to nothing. Come to me. So the word is to come. Come as you are. Because it's not you who's going to do it. It's God who's going to do it. Just because you come as you are, it doesn't mean you're going to stay that way. He's going to change you in the process. And you being willing or you humbling yourself in all humility coming shows that he's already working in you, in itself. Because a prideful person won't go at all. So I would tell that unbeliever, just come, just as you are. And I leave with this statement, which is this, death is not an accident, it's an appointment. Death is not an accident, it's an appointment. It is appointed until man wants to die and after come judgment. So when you see Jesus and you get a depart from me, I never knew you, or would you get a well done, my good and faithful? So once again, death is not an accident. We may look at it, it might happen as a tragic accident, but it was that appointment. It was that time that you were meant to be called home. Like that's it, grace was done for you. Believer or unbeliever, that's it. Your assignment is done. And this is it. It's a tragic thing for an unbeliever, and it's a beautiful thing for a believer in Christ. So I leave with the the, the message of the series or the title of the series, Be Ready, because it can happen today. Let us stand and let us pray. Come up and be here with me, Marcia. So we we get ready to close out in prayer. Of course, um, I, I pray that this message man comforts you if you're a Christian, and I pray that it convicted you if you're non you're a non-believer. Because this event will happen, and it will shake the world and it will change the world forever. And um it would be a it would be a tragic thing for an individual to think that they're saved. And they're really not. It would be a tragic thing for an individual to listen to this message and not take heed to it and want to bring or want to want to come to Christ and to want to change. This is not a message to persuade you in any way, but this is a message to enlighten you with truth. Nothing else matters, man. Literally nothing. You cannot take a you cannot take a U-Haul truck with you. I just went to a funeral this past weekend of my brother and connected to it. There was no U-Haul. There was not his cars, there was not a, a, a truck, it was nothing behind it. It was just a grave. Six feet. That's all it was. You cannot take anything with you. So before we go ahead and close out, close your eyes, bow your heads. I'm going to make a simple call, and this simple call is a, a call of salvation. If you have not trusted the Lord as your personal Savior, I want to tell you that Christ came in human form, and he died for your sins. According to scripture, you and I were born separated from God, and everything that we do, we do it in a sinful way. You don't believe me? Ask a baby a question. I promise you he'll lie to you. (laughs) That in itself shows you that we're sinful by nature, and we're born separated from God, the Bible says, right? And because of Jesus, and it's the sufficient sacrifice God in himself, in his love, John 3, 16, he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for you and I so we cannot experience this thing called death. Even if we die, we will be, we will be with him forever. And then the Bible says because of Jesus' sacrifice, right, because of his blood, he says he will zip, up our, or he will zip away our unrighteousness and he will zip up the righteousness of Christ on us. So when God sees us in the day of judgment, he would not see, fill in the blank, your name. He would see his son, Jesus. So my brothers and sisters, if you have not trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, my petition is this. Today is the day of salvation. If you meet him today, would you, would you, would you see him in a place of, of despair, be sent to in a place of eternal torment, or will you be embraced by the Savior himself? 
So I'm going to ask you, if you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you are a, a Christian and, and you're in a false convert, and you know your life doesn't match anything that we talked about, I don't anticipate him. I heard this before many times in the churches. I, 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 I live a life in habitual sin. I do all these things. If this is you today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as you are right now. In Jesus' name. If you have not trusted him, amen, my brother, I see you. Anybody else? If you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Don't be deceived. Like, do not be deceived. It, it, you could come to church. You could hear words of comfort. You could go to another church and, and witness motivational preaches. You could witness all that. But it's conviction being preached in that church. It's change being preached in that church. I don't know how I feel, Pastor. I feel offended. Good. Offensive bring change. Pain brings change. You, you don't believe me? A woman, when she gives birth, she experiences pain. But when she sees that baby, she experiences, watch this, comfort, love. My brothers and sisters, you can experience that today in Jesus' name. If you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, once again, I want you to slip up your hand one more time. I see my brother right there. Anybody else? I see my brother right there. Anybody else? For those that are watching us online, I'm going to make that call too. Slip into our DMs right now. We'll go ahead and we'll call and we'll pray for you right now. This is a serious thing. This is a serious thing. Eternity is on the line. Slip into our DMs. Amen. I see you guys. Anybody else? And if you're, if you're a Christian today and your life has been in cycles of, of habitual sin and despair, I don't care if you raised your hand up last week. Raise your hand right now. Let's pray for you. Let's get things right right now. Let's change. Amen. Amen, my sister. Amen. Amen, my brother. Amen. Amen, my brother. Amen. Amen. Let's do something gangster. <laughs> Let's slip out of your pews. They're waiting for you in the back to pray for you. Everybody who raised their hand, everyone, raise their hand. They're waiting for you in the back. The prayer doesn't save you. It's the posture of your heart. Remember that. And as the woman who, 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 who was forgiven, who was committing adultery, who was caught in adultery, as the Bible says, go and sin no more. Yes. They're waiting for you in the back. Everybody who slipped up their hands. My brother with the hat, they're waiting for you. Ain't nothing, don't be scared. It's nothing. <laughs> my brother with the black shirt, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you, my bro. Let's pray. Let's pray. I've seen you slip up your hand. We just want to pray for you. That's all. No shame, no nothing. You, you, your friend, she could go with you. You want to go through or you could just going to wait? We'll pray with you. I'll pray with you right now if you want. You want to pray? Come up here, man. Let's pray. I was trying to hide you in the back, but you want to come up here. What's your name, man? Shane, God bless you. Give me a hug. You can sit right here and we'll, I'll pray with you after. I promise you it was the best decision you ever made in your life. Amen. At this moment, I just could picture, man, you were snatched by the grace of God. Amen. For anybody else, um, bow your heads and reach your hands out, man. There's no power in this, but there is the presence of God in this room. And let us worship and let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity, Father God, to share such a glorious hope message, Lord. I thank you for your grace. Your, I thank you for, man, just, man, your love, your mercy, Father God. I thank you for just being with us, Lord. For you are not a distant God. You're not a God that's just sitting up in heaven looking down on us, Father God. You are with us in the midst, and I thank you. I thank you for everything that you're going to do. I thank you for the lives of everybody that walked in that back, Lord Jesus, that trusted you. My brother up here, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, for the Christians that, that, that they know they've been living a lukewarm life. I pray, Lord Jesus, that today, Father God, they walk away and turn away and no more they do the things that they used to do. I pray for myself, Lord God. I pray for your strength, Lord Jesus, to keep going forth despite, Father God, the trials and the enemy attacks, Lord Jesus. I will proclaim you, Lord God, into the end of the earth. And for everyone in this place, Father God, to be ignited on fire, to understand that this message is serious. Eternity is on the line. 
It, it doesn't matter if you're looking at it from a, uh, from a worldly perspective, whatever it is, Lord Jesus, we know that this event will happen, Father God. And I pray for these that are sitting in the pews that they're ready. In fact, I pray that they ignite it on fire. They walk out these doors, Lord Jesus, and they speak and they talk to every person that they encounter. And then next week we see the pews filled, not because of a man preaching, because we want to encounter the word of God, Lord. And we want to experience change, Jesus. And the only reason why people are coming is because we're speaking and we're giving them the gospel. I pray, Father God, for a revival in this place. Not for the gratification of me because I'm the preacher, not because of the leaders, not because of the church name. No, because of you, Jesus. We would not experience revival unless we first repent, Father God. Let it start with the church, Jesus. Let us turn away and sin no more, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. As the great prophet Isaiah says, here I am. Let's say it together. Here we are. are. Send us, Jesus. And I pray this and I release this, these people into your arms in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me pray with you.